Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today for Sunday School Highlights. Today we're talking about faith. Today is the 14th of January. It's over half, well, it's half gone. What on earth time is speeding along? Grab you a cup of coffee and join us this morning. This is hot. Mmm, one little sip. Ooh. We are still in our Sunday School book that we usually are in, Lifeway, um, Bible Studies for Life, Personal Study Guide. You don't have to have the book, but many of you ask me about the book, so I always want to give you the option there. You can order them, but we don't sell them, uh, but you don't need one because I always give you book, chapter, and verse, and you can go to the real book, the Bible. All right, so let's do today's lesson. It's about faith, life-changing faith, in fact. And it was life-changing faith for our story today. It comes from Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. Faith begins with a call to follow Jesus. Now, these story today is literal. They, he literally called these men to follow him, and they dropped everything and did. It says, God calls us into adventures, which sometimes requires a deep faith, rather than the faith that longs for comfort and consistency. Now, some of us are happy with comfort and consistency, and some of us need that energy and that ongoing trying to find the next adventure. And the Lord knows our weaknesses, and He knows our strengths, and He won't lead us somewhere that He don't want us to be. So it's important to listen to Him. Luke 5, 1 through 3, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Him to hear the word of God, He stood by the lake of Genestar, that's my pronunciation, uh, and, saw, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would trust, thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So these ships had been fishing, and they were cleaning their nets. They were going about their daily lives, in other words. They were at work. Like if you were at work and Jesus came and said, hey, I need you. That's where they were. This was their life. This was their livelihood. This is how they fed their families. This was everything. It says, at the beginning of the story, we see Jesus teaching a crowd of people and Peter doing what fishermen do. Then Jesus asked Peter for a favor. Now, it took a lot of faith for Peter to do the things he did. Can you imagine the regret Peter would have felt if he had chosen to say to Jesus, we're really kind of busy here. This is my livelihood and I don't have time to help you. <clears throat> what would you do in this situation? Where would we find ourselves? Peter realized that he wasn't the main character. A crowd needed to hear God's word. Do you think you're the main character? Do you, do you think your life presents you as the main character? Are you... Uh, the helper, are you the one that should be obedient? Sometimes we get to thinking we're the main character of everyone's world. We are it. We gotta learn. Sometimes we've got to uh, analyze that. Are we the main character in this story? In this situation that's going on right now, am I the main character? Should I just obey and listen to what God's telling me to do? It doesn't benefit me. It may even cost me money. It may cost me thing, stuff from the world that I have acquired. Am I the main character or is God the main character? I like that part of it. Peter realized that he wasn't the main character and a crowd needed to hear God's word. We got a crowd needing to hear God's word out there, people. There's a crowd. Romans ten seventeen says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Peter realized that there was something greater going on here. Have you ever realized that? You don't know what it is. You have no idea, but you know that you're a part of something greater and that God is compelling you to do a work. We can only imagine that he was thinking as he watched Jesus share the word with the people from the hull of his little vessel. It is easy for me to look beyond the crowds of people that I pass at the grocery store, the football game, or the DMV. It's easy to forget that each life we pass is precious to God. Do you think of everyone you see as a child of God or, or a precious person placed on this earth by God? Do we think of that way? Sometimes we have problems 
seeing ourselves as not the main character in our story. How will you respond when Jesus says to you, can I borrow your boat? Has Jesus ever asked to borrow your boat, folks? Has he ever asked to borrow your time, your day, your stuff, your money? Has he ever asked you to make the sacrifice is what I'm asking. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out unto the deep and let down your nets for a drought. This is in Luke 5, 4 through 7. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, as thy word, I will let down the net. In other words, he said, Lord, we've done this all night. We ain't, ain't nothing out there. We, we've worked, we've fished all night long. But on your word, I'm going to go ahead and do it, he said. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in another ship, and they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. We've done it all night, Lord. There's no sense in doing it one more time. But because you said so, I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow you by faith. And they filled both boats so much that they were beginning to sink. That's the power of God, folks. It's not logical. God's power is not logical. We can't make sense out of it all the way. We can say, I've done that, Lord. I've talked to that person over and over. Lord, one more time, it's going to help. And, and now ain't the best time. And what you know, we can make excuse after excuse. And it doesn't seem logical. God says to do it. We need to hearken. I like what it says here. It says, um, I will let, it says, nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, Lord, you told me to, I'll do it. I'll go talk to that person one more time, Lord. I'll keep on keeping on, Lord. I'll do what you said, even though I don't see any way it's going to change. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my nets. I love that. <clears throat> I can't help but wonder if that was the response Peter would give when he told the story to others years later. I wish you could have been there. I wonder if that's what he said to him. I wish you could have seen it. I wish you could have been there. How many times you tell the story so good that you tell your audience that you're telling the story maybe 20 or 30 years later and say, I wish you could have just seen it. It is that amazing to you. Amazing things happen when we simply do what Jesus calls us to do. That's pretty plain. That's pretty easy to understand, ain't it? Uh, amazing things happen when we simply do what you're told. <laughs> That's, we, we forget that every time, don't we? We'll go through a, a series of, of obeying and doing what we think God wants us to do, and we'll be amazed. And the next time he tells us, we're like, mm, I don't know. Just simply do it. Peter was glad he did what Jesus told him to do, despite all the information and the experience he had about the futile nature of fish less that day. He did what Jesus said, and amazing things happened. He'd been out there probably for days. I don't know. We don't say, but he says they fished all night. But he did it, and the results were amazing. Luke 5, 8 through 11. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You don't even want to be around me, Lord. I'm awful. I'm awful. I'm sinful. You don't even need to be in my presence, Lord. You're so holy and you're so wonderful. Why would you even come in my presence? Is what he was saying. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes, which they had taken. And so was also James and John and the sons, sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They quit their job. They quit their livelihood. They didn't care. They followed him. 
Peter's response to Jesus startles us because of everything that he had seen on this crazy, miraculous day, he fell at Jesus' feet and proclaimed his sinfulness. He confessed. He showed faith. There was no high high five giving or shouting, woohoo, look at all the fish we have. We're rich. We can sell these for a fortune. No, no. He repented of his sins, basically is what it's saying here. He fell at Jesus' feet. He said, I'm too sinful, Lord. And why would such an almighty God stoop so low to intersect his life with ours? Have you asked yourself that 10,000 times? Have you asked yourself over and over and over? I read a thing the other day that said, I've given God millions of reasons to to not love me, but none of them have worked. God loves us. Perhaps we'll never understand this mystery, but that won't keep us from celebrating it. It won't keep us from revealing in the grace, from re, from revealing in the grace of Jesus Christ and His gift of eternal life. Why would God, Almighty God, send His Son for us? Just like Peter said here, I am way too sinful. Depart from me, O Lord. We don't deserve it. That's where the grace comes in, folks. That's where the mercy enters the room. And that's where eternal life starts for us. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. Some of y'all out there are saying, I, I've, I've been too mean. I've been too bad. Put yourself, read Luke, read Luke 5, 8 through 11. Read five, Luke 5, 8 through 11, and it will help you understand how you can't be too bad. The Bible teaches us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So quit bragging about your meanness. Quit bragging about how horrible you are. Quit trying to say, I'm the one. The Bible skipped. The Bible talked to everybody and said, nothing can separate them from God, but I'm the one. Quit saying that. You're, you're fooling yourself. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You've not done bad enough. You've not been wrong enough. Nothing. So quit saying you're the one that's too mean to be saved. Because the Bible says different. Let's don't, let's don't fool ourselves into thinking we have that much power. Because Jesus says he's overcome all. Take him at his word. Jesus has a way of calling us out of the ordinary and moving us into the completely different place. Have you ever been moved by Jesus? You ever been moved? You ever moved to a new house and everything's completely different and it takes you a day or two to figure out even where the kitchen is or where the bathroom is when you wake up in the middle of the night? You're like, oh, we've moved. That's different, isn't it? Jesus can move your whole life your whole livelihood, your thoughts. He goes even more than the physical move. He goes to the spiritual move. He can move you spiritually to a different place. But so many people who lived, worked, and developed a life for themselves have a difficult time docking their boat. Going back to the story. Too much has been invested. It's too late to change. Do you hear yourself saying some of these things? I can't switch horses in the middle of the stream. It's important when you realize that you have only one life. You've got one shot at this. It's amazing. It's amazing the changes that can be made. This is the, this is the essence of deep faith. Deep faith. Not just casual passing. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I think so. This is deep faith. This is taking it to a whole new level. This is the essence of deep faith. Deep faith beckons us to adventure with radical uh, generosity of our time, talent, and our treasures. Deep faith takes you to that place where you realize your purpose here is to be a servant of God and to do what he beckons you to do and to be uh, trying to be fishermen of men, basically. And it takes you away from trying to acquire, obtain, and get more for you. Because when you acquire, obtain, and get more for you, and you work, and you work, and you put all your strength and your energy into obtaining more, 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 
someday comes the bitter reckoning that you're going to leave it. No matter what you did, no matter how much you gained. Death is the equalizer. Death equalizes the beggar on the street with the most powerful, wealthy person in the world. We're all the same. Death will equal things up for you now. You better be ready beyond death. You better get your heart, your soul right, get your mind right, get salvation on your side. Plan for that home, not this home. This home is so temporary, I can't even give you an example of how temporary it is. And it could be gone in the next second. Do you really want to put all your faith and your work and your toil into that? Now, am I saying don't have a nice home and don't? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying God expects us to, to have a home. He expects us to work. He expects us to provide for our families. He also expects us to provide for our spiritual well-being. He also expects us to provide for our fellow man. He also expects us to lead others to him to be fishermen of men. It's deep faith that allows us to dock the boat and follow Jesus, asking our Savior, what's next? I kind of like this story. I kind of like this lesson today. It was on a simpler plane. It was just simply, here it is, have that faith, dock that boat, move on, and have an adventure with Jesus. Now, am I saying that Peter and the disciples had a fun-filled, adventuresome life? No. Nope. I'm saying they worked and they toiled, but they had a cause. And we're still talking about them some 200, uh, some 2,000 years later. We're still discussing their lives. I hope I live a life that people will even remember a year after I'm gone. I'm hoping someday uh, when I'm gone, somebody will be sitting around going, remember John Davis? You remember him? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that it'll even last that long. Chances are it might last two weeks. <laughs> I mean, people move on. Your, your friends, your family, everybody's going to move on. But you're going to have to get preparations for that next life. You want to leave a legacy here that means something. You want to be make a difference because that's what God calls us to do. Make that difference. So the author says, live it out to examine. Take an inventory of your heart. Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads? We sing about that, don't we? Wherever he leads, I'll go. Drop a net. We all have unnecessary, useless activities and pursuits. This week, drop something to make room for God's call. Hmm, now there's a little sacrifice we could all make. Maybe you're going to, you've got plans every day this week to do something for you. That's fine. Do it. I encourage you. Do things for you. Do things for uh, that make you happy, that makes your heart sing. But also, take some of that time and dev devote it to God. Um, speak. Share your personal story of salvation with someone who isn't a follower of Christ. Am I telling you to go out on the street corner and start preaching? If the Lord tells you to, you can. But no, I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you to say to someone else today, share your story or this week. Share the story of how you once were lost and not found and the Lord found you and how salvation may have changed your life. Share your story with where I was and where I am now. Maybe you see someone mirroring your life and they're in the same place you was in back then before you made your change and you can simply tell them. I understand where you're at because I was right there. I made a change. I found Jesus Christ in my life and salvation and by faith I'm living every day and it's made a change in me. Share those stories. It don't hurt anything. Folks, let's make this year about carving out a little bit of time for the Lord. It's, it's the new year. It's the 14th day of the year. People's trying to make changes in all kinds of things from their weight to their exercise habits to the eating well, spending more time with family. All those things are wonderful. Nothing wrong with any of them. But also make sure we're carving out a little bit of time for him, a little bit of time for his work and the adventures he may have set up for us to say, here's what I need you to do. Dock that boat. I like that saying. Maybe we should use that as our little uh, logo for 24. Dock your boat. Don't, don't, 
don't bring all that stuff with you. Just dock your boat and let God use you. Folks, as always, it's such a blessing to be here, and it's a favorite part of my Sunday. And y'all are so special and great to even join me here, and I appreciate it. I really do. Uh, so many of y'all say this is your Sunday school because you're not able to get out and with cold temperatures and stuff. I'm sure several other, several additional people may be staying in during this time. But uh, as long as the Lord gives me the will and, and tells me that this is what he wants me to do, I'll try my best to meet you here every Sunday morning unless something comes up. And um, just pray that you, you will get something out of it and that uh, we'll get some out of it together. When I'm teaching a lesson, I'm learning. I'm learning when I'm studying. I'm learning even at this time when I'm giving it to you. And it speaks to me every time more than it does anyone else. I often think, Lord, that one was just for me, wasn't it? That lesson right there, that was had my name on it. <laughs> you all pray for us and we'll pray for you. We're going to pray right now at this time uh, and ask God to touch everyone and every prayer request that's out there. So if you would like to join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you this way. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us faith and you've given us hope and you've given us peace, dear Lord. In this coming year, we pray that we'll just... Dedicate more time and efforts to your work and what you would have us to do, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we know there's many prayer requests out there. Those spoken and unspoken. There's ill, there's sick folks out there, folk, Father. And we just pray that you'll help them and heal them and dry every tear and answer every need, dear Lord, in your time and your will and your glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Y'all pray for us and we'll pray for you and we'll all get through. Y'all have a blessed day. Bye now.